Welcome to the Health on Track podcast. Let's talk well-being. Welcome to the Health on Track podcast, offering you a shot of wellness. My name is Noor. I'm the Regional Health and Wellbeing Manager at GIG Gulf. Healthy eating and diets are a topic with countless opinions and approaches and myths. We're here to shed some light on how to understand your body and figure out the approach that best suits you. We're here today with Lima, a clinical dietitian and health coach with over than seven years experience in weight management, food intolerance, diabetes, and so much more. We are glad to have you here with us, uh, Lima. And I'm glad to be here. So I understand uh, that you take a personalized uh, approach with each one of your clients. Can you, can you tell us more about this and explain how, uh, how it works? Okay, so basically there's no plan that works for everyone. So there's no specific diet plan that can be for the same people, even if these people have the same height and the same weight. Each person's lifestyle is different. And when I do a diet plan or lifestyle modifications for any single patient, it should be personalized in a way that I need to know what do they eat every single day for the first three days. I need to see pictures because when I see pictures, I would understand more because we all grab a bite if we're at work or if we're in the house running, doing different errands, and we find a piece of chocolate in the kitchen or like a piece of fruit, we would eat that, but we wouldn't realize. Mm -hmm. So when I see pictures, uh, first of all, the patient will be like they would open their eyes for the different foods that they're eating and not counting. And I would understand what their body would need. And let's say if they're in emotionally eating or physically eating, I would understand why and how we can find the perfect approach for them because what, what, whatever plan that they're going to be on, it should be based on their lifestyle. They shouldn't feel more than 5% change of what they're used to. And that is the, the, the exact way for them to actually follow the lifestyle modification. And do you think that three days will give you an idea about their routine? Because I, I'm sure that we're not following a specific routine every day in terms of eating. Definitely, each day is different, but I would have a better idea about their lifestyle. So when I do a plan, and again, the plan that I always do is always different options. Yeah. It's not you need to eat chicken today and beef tomorrow, and it's not that you need to be on zero carbs or, or, or you need to be having this specific type of food. It's never that way, but it will give me a better idea. Do they eat out? Do they cook? Um, do they have long hours at work that they can't even take a break? So I can't force them to, to take a break if their work does not um, allow that or that they don't have time. I can't tell them you have to get out of your meeting at three and have your meal. It doesn't work that, that way. But three days is enough for me to, to have the idea. An idea. Exactly. At the same time, I do go for a different approach where I would be with them through WhatsApp on a daily basis. They do have the option to keep on sending me everything that they eat on a daily basis. And some people don't prefer that. Others do prefer because this is going to motivate them. So if they have a question or anything, like they can just do it. Like I still remember I had a patient where she called me and uh, she's like, I'm not in the mood to go to the gym can you give me some motivation i'm like okay i'm gonna stay with you on the phone get dressed and go to the gym and i actually stayed with her on the phone and she went so people need motivation it's never about just a piece of paper of a, like a diet plan or lifestyle modifications they need the motivation to actually change their eating habits and if someone can change the eating habits i believe that they can do anything in life because it's the hardest uh, I think this is uh, lead us to a question about food cravings. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about the food cravings? And from your perspective, how we can manage it? Okay, uh, how I see food cravings <coughs> is 100% how you start your day uh, or how you eat. So if you, you start your day with just fruits, fruits are carbs, so they're going to spike your blood sugar. But if you have them with like um, healthy fats, like nuts or like some chia seeds, we need something that that has protein and that has fiber because protein and fiber is going to slow the blood sh sugar spike. At the same time, it's going to make you feel full longer. So I truly believe there's two different things for you to crave sugar. It's either after lunch or after breakfast. If you're having super high carb, not enough protein, not enough carbs, and you're eating a lot at the same time and super fast, after you're done with lunch, you feel super tired, that you can't even continue working and you feel really heavy. So you feel like you need to go for that cup of coffee with sugar and that cup, um, that uh, piece, piece of chocolate, chocolate yeah. or cake to give you the energy. And that exactly would just spike your blood sugar and, and the cycle will keep on going. So how you start your day is why you would crave and even your 
main meals, if you eat something without high protein, high fiber, you will definitely crave something sweet. Right. And I think this is a perfect advice, especially that now uh, we are in Ramadan and people are fasting. So uh, can you give us some tips on how to break the fast and how to prepare our suhoor so we can at least avoid the spike that you just mentioned? Of course. So when we want to start, when we want to break our fast, we need to do it with dates. Mm -hmm. Dates is the most important thing that you need to break your fast with. And right. research, it's sugar, it's, it's it's sugar it. but the sugar in the dates will actually spike it not in a way that that let's say uh, a piece of like sambusa or like kubbe or something that would oh my god so, so we should not start with definitely because okay. if you do first of all you're gonna feel super hungry you're gonna overeat then you're gonna feel like you can't move until suhoor really that's that's exactly what happens because when you go to any gathering and you see how we break our fast how do people usually they start with break? appetizer which we just exactly. mentioned with the sambusa kuba and all these and uh, then they keep on eating or they just sit down all at once and eat super high yes. carb fatty food without without enough let's say protein or enough fiber so what happens is that they feel super tired they just want to sit all day or they don't feel full enough they need to keep on eating okay. the yes. whole day yeah and then they reach the point where they feel like they're starving and they need to eat so they can maintain fasting the next day. So they would have something that is extremely high in fat, like a burger, pizza or something. But when we break our fast, yeah. it should be with dates and then it should be soup or water. But it shouldn't be super cold water because super cold water will cause bloating. And it's very, um, like, it's very harsh on your stomach. It should be something warm because you need to hydrate after long hours. So if I will just imagine the the uh, uh, the steps, I will start with the date, yes. then hot soup, then uh, normal water. No, no, like soup and water well, could be okay. together, and then you can have the salad with the protein and the carbs. All together? You can have it okay. all together. As long as you had your dates, you had your soup, what's going to happen is that you, you would be I would say about 40-50% full. So when you start with the carbs and like the protein and the veggies and all that, you're not going to overeat because you already feel full and you already feel energetic. But if you start wrong and you start with, let's say, the main course with rice and chicken and all that or fried foods, so what's going to happen is that you're going to keep on eating, eating, eating. And this will increase the blood sugar and decrease it super fast. And this is why after we break our fast in like 20 minutes, we have a full plate of dessert right in front of us, right? So that is this, the same thing. Same thing for suhoor. How you actually have your suhoor is how you're going to break your fast the next day. So suhoor is more important than actually the futur. So in suhoor, what do you recommend to have? Okay, so we need something that will not make you that thirsty. Bananas, potassium. That's your best friend. Have a banana every single day, but definitely not. It's not going to be alone. You can have with it some Greek yogurt, some oats, some chia seeds. You need something that's going to hydrate you, something that's high in protein, but at the same time, that will keep you feeling full. But if you have burger, pizzas, or the fried foods that we usually have it during Ramadan, people would have it for suhoor and for futur at the same time. So if I'm going to have my suhoor, something that is fried or something that is spicy with a lot of spices what's going to happen is that i'm literally going to feel super thirsty and super hungry the, ne the next day i'm not going to have even enough energy but if i have eggs if i have cheese with let's say whole grain um bread toast with some veggies yeah. like i would always say your uh, suhoor should be just like the healthy futur like the healthy breakfast, I would say, that you would have regularly. It shouldn't be something that you would have for dinner or for lunch. Uh, Lima, uh, do you think that Ramadan is the right time to do and implement these changes that you're talking about? Because today maybe I'm not, I'm not, I'm not following this kind of diet or this kind of uh, health eating. Uh, is Ramadan is the right time to start with? Ramadan is the perfect time because in Ramadan, while fasting, it actually um, helps with healing your body. If you have any inflammation, exactly. if you have anything. With the intermediate fasting, exactly. I think it's, it's a collaboration between this and uh, implement the healthy eating as well. 100%. So with Ramadan, it might be a bit hard with the first, second day, but with Ramadan, it's the easiest month to lose weight, change your habits into healthier ones. So once once you start changing your habits, it will stay with you after 
Ramadan, it's the easiest way because you're already fasting for, I would say, since the morning until like what, 7 p.m. So you're fasting, you're yes. fasting. Yeah. So it's just those a couple of hours, how you break your fast and what you eat. It does not mean you cannot have anything fried. It does not mean you cannot enjoy the desserts that we usually have during Ramadan. It all comes back what and how much always this should be a rule whether exactly it should be a definite rule whether it's ramadan or not 80 percent it's food foods that are higher in nutrition value and 20 percent food that are lower in each nutrition value there's no such thing as healthy or or unhealthy you could still enjoy both but 80 percent things that your body will benefit from and 20 percent even even on a daily basis your body does not have to benefit 100 percent from that but you would still enjoy but if you just keep on having the healthy food 100 percent because you're forcing yourself mm -hmm. this will not stay with you for long at, at some point, the healthy eating will literally become 5 to 10 percent and just 90 to 95 yeah. percent, it's food that your body is not going to benefit from. Uh, I have many uh, friends uh, that are always saying that I can't burn fat even that I'm cutting off the carbs, the sugar. So is it the genetic things? That's why they, uh, they couldn't burn fat or is there any other reason behind that? Okay, so genetics plays a huge role. Okay. But there's nothing called, I have slow metabolism, I cannot lose weight. If, if you do have medical conditions, okay, I would totally understand and we can work on that because there's specific life, some modifications, specific things that you need to do. Like, let's say if you have hypothyroidism, you need to be on specific medications and the specific life, some modifications. But if you don't have any medical condition, it doesn't mean that you have a slow metabolism because cutting out carbs does not mean that you will lose weight because you need carbs. It's the source of energy. The God created us. The source of energy for our body is carbs. So you need to be having carbs. So I believe that when people do strict diets what happens is that you lose muscle mass and muscle mass is connected to your metabolism so when you start losing muscle mass you automatically start losing your metabolism so when you keep on doing diets all the time strict i stop strict i stop strict i stop what happens is that your metabolism will be super low so as much as you're going to be super strict you're not going to see any difference so it all goes back to the diets that you used to do but there's nothing called i have slow metabolism i can't reach my goal then the plan that you're on and the last modification is not based on your body 100 percent do you recommend they have to seek for professional uh, uh, advice definitely because based on your body because the dietitian will tell you what your body needs and based on the analysis that she will have she would know the muscle mass the body fat if you have any water retention and based on the blood test do you have any deficiencies in your vitamin just like vitamin d people think it's very normal that okay we're all deficient no vitamin d will increase the chances for you to increase the fat in your stomach area really yes so people think that v vitamin d is very normal that we're all deficient that's okay no we need to do that because the vitamins they're responsible for all our organs so they need to be in the normal range you don't have to wait until i can't move out of bed so let me do a blood test and check no it should be done every six to eight months and I think we should not follow other experiences. We should focus and understand and be aware of the things that we need to implement. As I mentioned, that we need also to ask for help uh, for, from experts uh, that can uh, guide us on the right journey. Um, um, I want to ask about the word healthy, uh, that it's a lit little bit abused now, everyone using it, and uh, we need to determine uh, what is healthy, what's not. Because for example, I can see many post articles are um, talking about oats. It's very healthy that you can start your day with versus other schools. Maybe they're saying, no, it's not healthy. So how can we determine things or products, whether they are healthy or not? OK, I believe there's no something that's called healthy or unhealthy. And using the word healthy and unhealthy is the main reason why people are struggling with weight loss or obesity absolutely because we always have this thing you should eat healthy to lose weight no you shouldn't live on grilled chicken and veggies to, to lose weight even if you don't want to lose weight no one could live especially like in our cultures like food is the most important thing and you need to enjoy food because food like all types of food they taste good you need to enjoy it so there's nothing called healthy or unhealthy because in my opinion you should have 
both. You should enjoy both because people think I should be healthy to lose weight, so I need to stop eating. I need to exercise on a daily basis, which personally, going to the gym on a daily basis, I don't see a thing for me. I would say, because it's not something I can sustain. Being active on a daily basis, I can sustain. But going to the gym on a daily basis, I can't. I can sustain three, three to four times a week. Other than that, I personally can't, but I can still be active on a daily basis. So just using the word healthy for, I would, I truly believe it's for marketing purposes that they overuse the word healthy. healthy. And um, it's the main reason for obesity, because everything that we do in life, is not healthy and is healthy at the same time. But each person's perspective is different. Just like how there's videos now that veggies will kill you, will actually kill you. Yeah. So you shouldn't have veggies and you shouldn't drink water or you shouldn't eat fruits. It doesn't work that way. The only people that should be that restricted is people with medical conditions and they have to. They don't have any other choice because their life depends on that. But regular people know you can eat whatever you want but the point is lifestyle modifications. And because we're overly used the word, the word healthy and diet, so we think that I wanna lose weight, I'm just gonna eat boiled eggs all day. Or I'm just gonna eat veggies all day. And then I'm just gonna snap because I'm starving. My mood's gonna be extremely bad. Yeah, I'm gonna be hungry. Exactly. I'm gonna eat everything unhealthy or things that my body is not gonna benefit because I'm just so mad at myself. And then I'm gonna feel super guilty. So I'm gonna fast or I'm gonna skip the next three, four meals and the cycle continues. So there's nothing called healthy or unhealthy. There is something based on your lifestyle, based on your body needs, because you and your sister are not gonna be on the same yeah. lifestyle exactly. modifications. Your, even sisters, if they're twins, identical twins, they're not gonna be on the same plan. We need to be maybe more mindful on, on the things that we like uh, to add in our uh, food routine. And also, as you mentioned, the portion sizes, you know, eat whatever you want, but be mindful on the portion size. I feel like it's the comparison. When we go out, we see that people where they're, let's say if someone's obese or they're overweight and they sit with someone that isn't and they see the portion sizes that they're eating, they would believe that I should eat the same. No, you, you should not eat the same. Or no, I, I should do exactly what she's doing so I can lose weight. It would never it's work. It's not right. So I feel like it's we compare a lot and this is what why we over abuse the word healthy or the word diet. If someone lost 30 kgs, they can't tell you how to lose weight because how you're gonna lose that 30 kgs is 100% different than how they lost the, the 30 kgs yeah. so you can't compare and you can't just use the word healthy for everything um, another concept that we hear about is the food freedom so can you explain what it is and how can we reach that okay so the food freedom is when you reach to a point where whatever is in front of me in the table i can eat but i'm going to enjoy it at the same time so let's say there's cake in, in front I can of me. eat or i can manage because maybe i have cupcakes i have cakes i have uh, sweets exactly. but i can't ignore them and maybe eat something healthy? Okay. I, I would always tell all my patients this. If I'm in an outing, okay, or I'm in like um, a gathering with friends, which is not on a daily basis, two, yeah. two, three times a week, okay, I'm going out for dinner, I'm going to someone's house, there is everything. There's chicken, there's beef, and there's veggies, fruits, there's salads, and there's cupcakes, chips, and all that. Okay, this is the plate. 80% of it, things that my body will benefit from, and 20% of it, things that my body is not gonna benefit from, but I love, mm. I, I enjoy. There's cupcake, cake, and chips, and all that. No, what do I crave the most as a, what do I like the most? I'm more into cupcakes, let's say. Okay, so I'm gonna have a cupcake. I don't have to restrict myself and feel bad that everyone's eating except me, go back home, eat a box of cupcake, not even one, and feel guilty about that. Or I can just eat that cupcake and enjoy it. If I eat something, it's already inside my body. It doesn't make any sense for me to feel guilty about. Yeah, and if it's a small thing, I, I think I will feel satisfied that I already ate what I want. And this is food freedom, to reach that point. To reach the point where whatever is in front of me, I'm gonna eat and enjoy, but I know my portions. But if I originally restrict myself, it's either I'm gonna eat all that, or I'm gonna restrict myself more and not eat anything, feel guilty, leave on my way back home, 
go to the supermarket and buy every single thing that I restricted myself from and I'm gonna eat, eat, eat until I feel like I can't breathe. I'm gonna feel super, super guilty, which I'm gonna fast or restrict myself from food the next day. Tab, uh, can you give us some uh, uh, advice on maybe uh, small changes or habits that we can incorporate in our lives so it can lead to a healthier uh, lifestyle? Sure. Number one is water. Your body does not know the difference between hunger and thirst. When you're thirsty, this is the first stages of dehydration. So sometimes you would feel hungry, but you just had a full meal. But if you had water and waited 15 minutes, that hunger feeling will just go away how, completely. How can I embed this in my daily routine? Is it in the morning you... you, you... Okay, you so feel that it's better to start with the water? With when you first wake up, you have to start with the water. Okay. And the, the water shouldn't be, let's say, I would drink 500 ml in the morning and 500 ml during lunch and 500 ml during dinner. It doesn't make sense. Your body has the capacity to benefit from water, um, like a little water at once. So you should drink throughout the day. And you shouldn't keep yourself long until you feel thirsty. At the same time, something that's really important, if I'm used to eating out three times a week, and I usually eat burgers, let's say, sorry, three times a day, and I'm usually, usually I would eat things that my body's not gonna benefit from. If I wanna change my lifestyle, I can't just have grilled chicken th three times a day. What I would do, I would choose one meal a day, and I would change that into a healthier aspect. And the other two meals, I would still have something that is not, it's not gonna benefit yeah. my body. And then when I get used to that, I can change the second one. And then I can change the third. Then I can like, put in my weekly, once or twice a week, something that my body is not gonna benefit as a full meal. And at the same time, enjoy it. But I can't just do like out of once, I just wake up, I'm just gonna eat veggies all day. It doesn't work that way. You need to take it step by step based on your lifestyle. Perfect. Uh, my last question uh, is about the trends that we are hearing uh, about dairy free, gluten free, sugar free. So what do you think about that? Is it something that we need to follow as well when we uh, choose our products? I believe, okay, so fun fact, the gluten-free is not healthier than products with gluten. You should be gluten-free only if you need to because your condition, medical condition, okay. does not allow you to, to eat gluten because gluten-free products are actually higher in fat and higher in processed and higher in calories. And can you name products. quickly the conditions, some of the conditions Celiac. that they need? Okay, celiac. Okay. If you're intolerant to, disease. yeah, it's an yeah. autoimmune disease. If you're intolerant to gluten, you should, eliminate that. Some people are allergic to gluten, but mainly it's celiac. They but need to be 100%. if I don't have any problem, uh, it's not healthier to follow a product with a gluten-free. It's not sustainable. Okay. It, un unless you have your intolerant to gluten and the bloating and all that is going away. But you shouldn't be gluten-free because it's healthier. Mm -hmm. It's never okay. that case. Okay. Okay. Even for the sugar-free. Yeah sugar-free and all that, if this is something that you want and you're not, you don't feel like you're restricting yourself too much, then you can do it. A lot of people don't really care about sugar. It's not something that they crave or they like. So if there's a cake in front of them or anything, they would never go for like a bite. So these people can go for sugar-free, but you can't just sustain sugar from your lifestyle if you enjoy that. You should have it, but 20%, not more. Thank you so much, uh, Lima. I know that it's a, it's a, a very heavy topic uh, and we have many questions, uh, but because of time, maybe I can ask you the last one. If you have a piece of advice, what would it be? The piece of advice would be don't be too hard on yourself because weight gain and obesity starts when you're too hard on yourself. So just know that you need to be healthier for you. And by that, just be on lifestyle modifications. Don't be too strict on yourself because this is just going to ruin your hormones and you're going to have different medical conditions from that. Thank you, Lima, for joining me today in exploring that healthy eating. Uh, I encourage everyone who's listening to this episode to start implementing these changes, these small changes that are manageable in the daily routine, uh, maybe adding maybe extra vegetables in the serving or uh, changing the whole uh, food to uh, over processed food and maybe might be mindful uh, in the portion sizes. Uh, I think every choice matters. Definitely. So before we conclude, let's remind ourselves of the importance of nourishing our bodies with the right food, food that fuel us, sustain us, and contribute to an overall well-being.
Make sure to join our next episode in April. We will talk about autoimmune diseases, a phenomenon that is becoming more and more common. Remember, we're available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Angami. Until next time, stay well and take care. Thank you. Thank you.